There we go. Okay. Okay, right, let's get back into this. Here we go. So what is Reformed theology? Reformed theology is a theology, not a religion. So that means theology is how you, it, it's the study of God. So Reformation, Reformed theology is not a religion. We don't worship it. We don't worship Calvin. We don't worship Luther. We don't worship Zwingli, any of those people. Beza, Reformed theology, it shapes how you view God, how you view yourself. Because theology is about God, religion is about man. When you think about it, Islam, Islam, uh, you're, you're worshiping Muhammad ultimately, and then Allah. Theology is all about God. Reformed theology is a, a way to view God and a way to view his word. It's how you study his word. Um, the verbum day, the word of God, the vox day, the voice of God. You, you have a high view of scripture. Um, if we could uh, mute ourselves, please. There's some background noise going on. All right. So, and if you have a question or anything, just pop in. But... Reformed theology has a high view of Scripture. Scripture is the voice of God. It's God breathed. It. This is where we gain our views on God, our views on how we worship Him. All of that comes from Scripture. So, your theology, how you study God should come from the Bible and from nature in the sense of how he reveals himself in nature, that he is the creator. So it's not that you go out there and worship a tree, but nature reveals that, hey, there is a creator. The Bible tells you who that creator is, what he's like. That shapes your theology. Your theology should never shape the Bible. The Bible crafts, it molds, it shapes your theology. If your theology bumps up against the Bible, which one should win? The Bible. The Bible. So you don't you, you don't let your theology or what you believe about God, what you've been taught about God, change the Bible. The Bible affects how you view everything. So I just want to make that clear. Reformed theology is not a religion like Christianity, uh, Mormonism, anything like that. Reformed theology is a way of thinking a way of interpreting scripture, putting things together. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. Now you said, now you said the Bible reflects everything that we think or do. The, the Bible should It should have a way of sharpening and shaping what you believe about everything, pretty much. The Bible, you know, how, how do you feel about abortion? The Bible should shape that. How do you feel about uh, euthanasia? The Bible can answer that. How do we feel about uh, missions? 
helping people, all of that sexuality is answered in the Bible. So the Bible is where we go to get our answers. It, it shapes how we view things. Yeah, if you listen to the television shows, um, you'll hear them talking about a biblical view versus a world view. So, yeah, yep. Chan is purporting that we should have that biblical view rather than what the world finds acceptable. Amen. Gotcha. Thank you for putting it in a better way, Mr. Brandon. I, I just repeated what you said just differently. <laughs> Have a biblical view, not a worldly view. Yes. Um, you, you know, you because the news is going to try to shape what you believe about everything. Um, so you, you put on the goggles of the scripture. And you let that filter everything before it gets into your heart. Everything filters through the Bible. So. Reformed theology is, number two, God-centered. God-centered. Um, it starts with God. Every topic in the Bible through Reformed theology starts with God. Your salvation starts with God. Because when you start with man, you're going to end up a totally different way. Um. So when you start with God, God is holy. You are a sinner. Therefore, in order for you to be restored to God, to be saved, he has to provide a sacrifice because we are unable to do that. We're dead in our sins. So all of that, you start with God. You trace everything back, and it's going to be God at the center. So Reformed theology is God-centered. It's not humanistic. It's theocentric. God is at the center. And so from that flows every other, well, this is not all of them, but this is just some topics we can discuss. So if God is at the center, that affects how we view ourselves. Anthropology is man, the study of man. What does the Bible say about us? We are what? Sinners, our hearts are desperately wicked. Yes, we're sinners. We're dead in our transgressions. Um, we're filthy, filthy rags. Nothing we can offer. We bring nothing to our salvation. But if you look at it from a humanistic point of view, some of these religions, this is where there's a little bit of good in man. And that little bit of good, he can go seek God. But that is not what scripture tells us. The Bible, because remember, Reformed theology, it, it starts with the Bible, starts with God. There is no good in anyone. Scripture teaches that. We're going to look at that probably next week. There's no good person. There's no good in us. We're dead. God has to quicken us, to use King James Version. He makes us alive. He regenerates us. So it's God-centered. You want to start with God. Christo Christology, the study of Christ, traces itself all the way back to God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So it, it teaches, it, it all centers back into God. Uh, soteriology, how you're saved. Reformed theology sees that man is dead in his trespasses and sins, which means he can't respond to anything unless the Holy Spirit quickens him, regenerates him, God gives him faith. All of this we're going to study later, but it's just an overview. Um, so like people, if you look at it from a human point of view, people are like, you know, I found God or, you know, he, he God was never missing. So you, you, you can't find him. Right. 
uh, or people who say, you know, I chose to be saved. We're going we're to look at things like that, you know. Uh, so, yeah, God-centered theology, man, bad, God, good. But a humanistic point of view is like, oh, you're not totally bad. And so this is where uh, Arminius, Joseph Arminius comes in, um, things like that, which we'll look at these people. So any questions on this so far? Double check. Okay. Hang on here. We got some people joining in, so we're gonna. There we go. Hello, hello. All right, so we we're just catching up on um, reform theology being God centered, uh, focused on the Bible. It's a way that we view everything. All right, so let's go back. Start here, share. Okay. Okay. So, um, would someone read this quote for us? A church without theology or a theology without God are simply not options for the Christian faith. One can have religion without God or theology, but one cannot have Christianity without them. What are your thoughts on that? What do you guys think? Agree? Disagree? I agree. Yeah. Agree? Okay. Amen. Yeah. Hey, and we can see that there are some churches who don't have a theology. They don't know what they believe about God. But for the true believer, that's not an option. Mm -hmm. All of life is theological. All of life centers around God. So, again, remember, religion is just for man. It, it, it has nothing to do with, you know, some people say Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. Um, it's more than that, but you know what they're what they're getting at there. Right. But you cannot have Christianity without theology. You have to know what you believe about God, sin, man, death, the afterlife, all of that. I have a comment. Yes, sir. There are some churches that. Uh, apparently don't really know who God is because they are not uh, they are not uh, disciplined to God the way that God asks us to be. Mm -hmm. um, I mean nowadays everybody thinks that if you're a certain way that you can have a church for it and that it's okay. And boy, to me, that is blasphemy. Yes. Well, that's the second part of that sentence there. Or the second sentence there, one can have a religion without God mm. or theology. Yep. I mean, you have church, what, the church that, the cannabis church. Yeah. You have all kinds of things. Um, and again, we're going to look at some stuff next week, uh, the different like creeds and stuff, and how those are guardrails. It helps you to see what's out of bounds. Um, even though some like Post Road is uh, part of the ref the ref the restoration movement, not to be confused with Reformed. And one of their things, the restoration movement, is, you know, we have no creed but Christ. Technically, that's a creed. You saying that you have no creed but Christ mm -hmm. is a creed. And they were, they were pushing against the, because they wanted to go all the way back to 
the Acts 2 church, the first century church? Well, the first century church had creeds. Even uh, 1 Corinthians 15, some believe is an early part of a creed. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, uh, with the, uh, the, the kenosis of Christ, the self-emptying of Christ, some say is an early creed. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, there's an early creed. So there are creeds in the first century, but a lot of it is people push against names being attached to stuff. They're like, oh, you believe that Calvin and all this stuff, and, and they don't really know what you believe. Um, now, calling yourself a Calvinist or an Armenian, it, it has no effect on your salvation. A lot of it is just for people to sit around and argue and discuss things. Um, but sometimes when you label yourself or people label you, that's when things, you know, but we can, we can have civil discussions about things. We may, even in this class, we may not all agree in eternal salvation, but that doesn't stop us from being brothers and sisters. Uh, no. Amen. That's not going to stop us. We can discuss it. We say, oh, well, you know, where do you see, how do you interpret this scripture? Well, I see it this way, you know, and so that is how we learn, that's how we grow. Um, because a lot of times you you want again, you want the Bible to change your theology. So never be so rigid in your theology where you're not open to a new idea. Um because some sometimes your views on eschatology will change, and that's perfectly fine. You may be a pre-trib rapture person, but as you study scripture, you may see a post-trib fits better, and that's fine. Uh, so we don't want to get caught up on those labels and titles. Uh, there. Okay, here's the good stuff. Here is some good stuff. So these, we're going to jump into those, these a little deeper. But the foundations of Reformed theology or covenant theology, is this. There, it's centered on God. He is the center. Um, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. What does Genesis 1.1 1, 1 say? The Word, the word was, was God. God was the Word. The Word was God. That's, like that. that's John 1. <laughs> I think that's pretty good, though. It but, is. Uh, but uh, in, yeah, in the beginning, God made uh, the heavens and the earth. Yep. And so for, for the Calvinist, for the Reformed person, Genesis 1-1, the first four words is our motto. In the beginning, God. Everything else comes after that. So God first. It's centered on God. So how I interpret salvation scriptures go all the way back to God first. It's centered on God. He is holy. He is sovereign. So therefore, he has the right to judge me as a sinner. He has the right to send me to hell. When We're going to look at before you were saved, every human was destined to go to hell. But God elected to choose certain people. And we're going to look at that. It's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. How can God choose to save some people and then some people go to hell? Because, well, quick answer, because everyone deserved to go to hell. The grace is that he chose some. He didn't have to choose to save anybody. And he would be perfectly just. And the church said on this one. Amen. Amen. So if God chose to send every single one of us to hell, that would not affect his holiness one bit. Correct. And so that comes from the fact that you see that God is holy. Any sin 
is an affront to God. So any sin sends you to hell. So we're going to look at election. That's tough. Predestination, all of that fun stuff. Uh, so it's centered on God. Number two, it is based on God's word alone. Everything comes from the Bible. We don't go to commentaries. It doesn't even matter what Luther or Calvin had to say on a verse. That doesn't matter. God's word alone is our foundation. It's our final authority. We are committed to faith alone. Oops, corner stopped. And I'm saying we because my goal is to convert all of you by the end of this class when we're done. So we're committed to faith alone, which means it's not faith plus your works. It's not faith plus the prayers of the saints and the praying to Mary. It's not faith and if I get three people saved a month. Faith alone is what saves you. But the faith that saves is never alone, which means you just don't sit on your blessed assurance. We are called to do works, but those works do not save. Yep. That's another check for an amen there. Yep. Uh, Lust Feldick always refers to it as faith plus nothing. Who's that? Les Feldick. Oh, I love him. I love him. The old, the old guy just up there with his Bible and just going away. Yeah, he, yeah. Yes. Uh, his, if you guys want to look, he's on YouTube. His name is uh, Les Feldick, if you guys want to look him up. Uh, he, he's not the most exciting person, but he, he is biblical. So Les Feldick, I think I spelled it right. You can look yep. him up on YouTube. Yep. Good guy. Um, Faith alone, faith plus nothing. Now, it's also devoted to the prophet, the priest, and the king, which is summed up in Christ. So you're in Reformed theology, you see Christ in his role as a prophet, his role as a priest, which is what he's doing for us now, and then when he comes back, his role as the king. That's what that's how we see Christ in these three offices in Reformed theology. Uh, and then also the nickname is Covenant theology, which we'll get into later as well. So if you hear Covenant theology, it's it's referring to Reformed theology. It's just a different name for it because it uses it sees the Bible as a fulfillment or an, an a interloping covenant, uh, how God relates to his people. Um, you may see some people may be dispensationalist, which they see that there are uh, different time periods and each one required a different thing in order to be saved. Uh, it, it says that God dealt with people differently um, in different eras, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at that because uh, it might be it's enough to make your head explode and some stuff. <laughs> okay, so let's get into the origins of this. Uh, origins of Calvinism. Hang on one second. Let me see if. Okay. So any any questions so far or anything? I don't want to lose anybody. Okay. So the 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 brain using portion comes a lot next week. From next week on, you have to make sure you bring your brains because we're going to do some thinking. May even have Mr. Brandon teach for a little bit. Yeah, the uh, brain power will go down significantly. No, no, no. Does anyone know where I might be able to rent one for next week? <laughs> I don't know. You might can find one these days. 
<laughs> I know, right? <laughs> okay, so again, if if there's anything that you guys need me to slow down on, go into deeper, please ask. Uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question. I've been writing really fast. Okay. Okay, so where did this start? Calvinism, Reformed theology, same thing, it's just different words, is rooted in the 16th century religious renewal in Europe which if you took history, the Protestant Reformation. Now, what do, what word do you see in Protestant? Protest. 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 What were they protesting against? Or who? Against, against you. What Ruth? I'm saying we're against the Messiah. Ruth says, "Was it uh, they were protesting that Jesus was not the Messiah?" No, um, not quite. Not quite. It's a little bit of that in there. They were going against the Roman Catholic Church, and the the selling of. Indul um, indulgences and uh, you have to pray through Mary only the Pope can interpret scripture for you all of this these people are protesting against this so what we have is Martin Luther born 1483 he dies 1546 Martin Luther is a very interesting man uh, there's a little humor here. He he was a um. What do you call those people who think something's wrong with them all the time? Hypochondriac. Um, yes. And so he he's very paranoid. Um, and he in this tower experience here, what happened was. Let me make sure. Do I cover him later in this or in Luther? Okay, I'll come. I'll jump to that in just a second. I don't want to get to, okay. So in his tower experience, he he, this goes before the ninety five thesis. And what happens is, Luther, um, he he comes to grips with justification by faith. He 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 teaches through Romans verse by verse for years and it torments him in the fact that he was brought up to see God as angry, ready to strike you down. Uh, he lived in a constant fear that he, he had a sin that he didn't repent for. So he was in a constant mode of repentance. And this ate at him. Uh, it, it gave him ulcers, stomach issues. Um, they, they even take, make jokes about him passing gas. He says that he hopes that he doesn't pass gas when he's defending himself in during these trials. And so he was so worried that he had done something to offend God at any second that God could strike him down. And this event, this came to a head when he's walking along one day and lightning strikes a tree. And he took that as God trying to kill him. So he, at that point, commits to becoming a monk. Um, hold on one second. I think someone's trying to jump in. What's on? Maybe. Okay, okay. Got that. Okay. Okay. 
All right, so oh, what happened? You know, we've got Martin Luther, and so they are reacting, protesting against the abuses of the Roman Catholic Church, the papal abuses, um, the captivity of the word. In the old in, in the in the fifteenth century, sixteenth century, they would literally chain the Bible to the pulpit because no one could interpret it. It had to stay with the Pope, with the priest. So you as a normal person didn't have a copy of the Bible. Um, the elevation of the monastery, the reformers taught the priesthood of all believers, which first Peter talks about. Um but the Roman Catholic Church taught that it was better for you to become a monk and all this. So, you know, Luther becomes a monk and all this. Uh, they good works. He's, he's protesting against good works. Uh, so you, you these are some of the terms you may have heard. Sola Scriptura, Sola Fide, Sola Gratia, Solus Christus, Sola De Gloria. This was the battle cries of the, 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 the Protestants, the, the Reformers. Scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, uh, glory to God alone. All of those were going against what the Roman Catholic Church taught. Scripture and tradition. You know, what did the early church, what did the early popes say? on top of scripture, faith and works, grace and merit. So all everything, the five solas, go against five main things that the Roman Catholic Church were doing wrong. So that's where, that's where you get the Protestant Reformation. They were protesting against the Roman Catholic Church. And we're going to cover each of these uh, in a later lesson. Uh, so we'll come back to that. Uh, Rasmus of Rotterdam. I'll, have, I'll give these notes on the Facebook page, so don't worry about that. Uh, Martin Luther. Yeah, so Martin Luther was in a constant state of fear that he had a sin that was not repented for. Can you imagine living like that? Because remember, in the Roman Catholic Church, you know, you had to confess your sins. You had to pay money and get indulge, uh, indulgences and all of this stuff out. So he's in a constant fear that, man, I just sinned. I got to repent. Man, I just sinned. I got to repent. So he would beat his body. If you, if anyone ever seen that, that terrible, terrible movie, uh, Da Vinci Code <laughs> and all of that unbiblical mess, but the, 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 the guy, you know, beating himself. Uh, I forgot what those people are called. But that is what Martin Luther did before he had this revelation of justification by faith alone. So he's in a constant fear that I've sinned against God. I have to beat my body. Yeah, and just, uh, just yes, the thought of, okay, I've sinned and I need to repent I need to to be absolved by the priest. Man. What happens if I die before I get a chance to do that? Yep. With, the, with that level of fear on on your shoulders as well. Yes. Yeah. That's powerful. To think that, man, if I don't if I don't confess this in time, if I die on the way to church to confess it, I'm going to hell or purgatory. So all of that is pressing down on Luther. And what happens is God gives him his answer in Romans chapter 1. So Luther begins teaching on Romans. Uh, he's interpreting, you know, Greek into Latin, all of this. And in chapter 1, he finally find, finds his answer. So let's look at Romans 1. And we're almost done for tonight. Uh, Romans chapter 1. Let's look at, uh, we'll start at verse 16 and 17.
And uh, someone wants to read that scripture for us. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So, so Luther finds this and he balances out because remember, he has this view of God as angry, ready to punish. How can I be righteous? He finds God's justice unbearable. How can I stand under the justice of God and I'm a sinner? So he comes to this verse, and this is this is uh, Greek here. What he would what he sees, um, Ugar. So for I am not ashamed of the euangelion to Christu, of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto soterion, unto salvation. For all who believe, first to the Jew, and then the Gentile. Now, what I've highlighted here in yellow, is in verse 17 where it says the righteousness of God. This is the phrase that captivated Luther. Diakosune gar theu, the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. And so Luther interpreted it to be God's righteousness and you have to stand up under that. And so that was pressing down on Luther until he saw it in a different way. Because you can interpret this as the righteousness that God gives. And that is the key. Because it's not your own righteousness. Because that's filthy rags. The righteousness that pleases God is the righteousness that he gives you as a believer, you put on the righteousness of Christ. Christ gives you his clothes, you put them on. And so when God looks at you, he sees Christ. You're perfect in his sight. So that phrase, the righteousness of God, is what starts the Protestant Reformation and what starts Reformed theology. And so you're going to, you know, we're going, we're going to see this phrase because it's not God's righteousness. It's the righteousness that he gives you as a gift. So Luther now sees that righteousness of God is given to believers. So for us right now in this class who believe, God has already given us his righteousness. So you're not a filthy sinner. You're, you're the righteousness of God. The righteousness of Christ is put into your account. Because before you were saved, spiritually you were bankrupt. You were overdrawn. You had all kinds of late fees. And you guys know how them late fees add up on those accounts. So what happens is God puts money into your account. He overpays your account by putting his righteousness into your account. So it's given because God wishes to give it. There is nothing you do in which you deserve God's righteousness. Does everyone agree with that? Amen. Amen. So it's given, it's a gift. There's nothing you do except receive it. God gives you his righteousness. He puts it into your account. Your account is paid in full. All the charges are gone. 
because God is sovereign and he wishes to give it to us. So both faith and justification are God's free gifts to you and me when we are sinners. You don't earn them. You can't work them up. He gives you the faith to believe, and he justifies you. And we're going to jump into that as well uh, next week. So we'll come back to that. Okay. So that was just kind of a brief, and I'm going to post these notes uh, in the group. But it's, this is just a beginning. So the Reformed theology comes from Luther, Calvin, all of them, Zwingli, and the Swiss Reformation going against bad religion, bad theology. And so we're going to see how those five solos, those five battle cries go on to kind of sum up what uh, Reformed theology is. I have a question. Yes, sir. Did I hear you say that uh, once Luther read that in Romans that he started teaching that to people? Yeah, he, he started he, he started teaching it correctly because he was he was a a professor and so he began to teach through Romans or preach through Romans and when he got to that 17th verse that's when God opened his eyes. All right, got gotcha. you. And that and that changed how he taught Romans the rest of his life. Okay, so thank you. Uh-huh. And that's the good thing about scripture is and we see that in this especially in Luther's life that his theology what he previously believed was affecting how he interpreted scripture until God illuminated his eyes and then scripture changed the way his theology was, which is how it should happen to us. Uh, you should never let anything change your, your theology but the Bible. So let's say you believe something, you've always believed this about what, you know, about drinking or smoking. You don't carry that into the Bible. The Bible will affect how you interpret that, and you will see different. That, you know, the Bible doesn't set out to answer every single question you have, but the Bible can answer que every question that you have. I so, know, uh -huh. I know of uh, some people interpret the Bible to fit their lifestyle. Yes, like smoking marijuana, where. In the Bible, it says every uh, God-bearing seed or whatever, and uh -huh. and they, you know, I mean, who's to say that the devil himself didn't put that there? You know, I mean, I mean, I'm yep. not, I'm not slamming against marijuana. I'm just talking about how people like to use that as as part of their uh, processing. You know. Yeah. I mean, they'll find a verse to support any kind of thing they want. And so our goal is to always let the Bible answer those questions. Um, and a good rule of thumb is, you know, if, if I do this, is it going to affect God's glory? You know, how am I doing, doing this particular thing how is it going to look in comparison to God's glory? Is it going to give more glory to him? Not saying that you can take glory away from God at all, but, you know, how how does this go with his holiness? Is one of the best ways you can live. And Paul gives us some answers also because he says, you know, everything for a believer is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. So Paul says, yeah, hey, if your conscience lets you smoke, you can smoke, but not everything is going to be beneficial to you. So that that's that we'll look at that too in in scripture like that. But the key thing I want you guys to take away tonight is 
uh, reform theology is not something to be afraid of. Uh, it's not something to worship. It's just simply how you view God in the Bible and everything like that. You know, how, you know, what's your authority? God's word. Everything that I see, I'm going to trace it back to God. It's going to start with God and go from there, not me. So, so when you hear Reformed theology, some people will talk bad about Reformed theology. Some people will say they are arrogant people. They, they believe that God damns everyone to hell except a few people. And so we're, we're going to look at what election is. It's a biblical word. It's a biblical concept, and you have to teach it. I mean, if we're honest, if we're true biblical Christians, we can't skip over passages because we're uncomfortable with what it talks about. Amen. Um, we're going to be studying First Peter as a church next month. We're going. I think the sermon series goes through First Peter. The first seven chapters of First Peter talks about predestination, election, and so you can't skip over it. It's in there. You have to deal with it. So, so we're going to look at that. Um, but again, you don't have to label yourself a reformed person. You don't have to label yourself a Calvinist because you don't follow Calvin. You don't follow Luther. None of those people died for you. It's just a way of viewing scripture is what it is basically what it is. All right. Uh, any questions before I let you guys go? As Frankie barely made sense. Want to make sure you're right before I let go. Okay. Uh, any prayer requests or praise reports? I have prayer requests. Yes, sir. Hit us. Uh, I pray. I need prayers for. My family lives next door. Uh, I've okay. been wanting to sell my house next door. And uh, it doesn't look good for them finding places to rent. And I'm not sure if that's what God is wanting me to do or not. <laughs> um, so pray for me and pray for them. Pray for the situation. Okay. We'll put Keisha on there in Georgia. <coughs> Weather that's coming. Thank you. Oh, yeah. What's it? Fred? Is that his name? Hurricane Fred? Hurricane. Tropical Storm Fred. Where do y'all get these names from? I don't know. No <laughs> idea. <laughs> I, blame, I blame you. <laughs> Fred, makes, Fred makes me think of Fred Flintstone. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. Every time I hear Fred, I think Fred Flintstone. Fred Flintstone. Fred Sanford. Yeah, Fred Sanford. That's what I think it is. Okay, we'll do that. Uh, the eternal storm. Uh, I, I know if he was on here, he would. But uh, Cleo uh, is going to be starting a new job, I think, next week. He, he, he found one doing the bus driving. But now he, he has a better job doing what he used to do, kind of like the fire safety thing. So he's excited about that. Praise the Lord. So, all right. So I will pray and we will be uh, dismissed. Let me start recording. Here we go.